Those college uh, folks that put this together in the last lecture committee um, for this opportunity. I know that you all have been working really hard. Um, <clears throat> I really don't have an introduction prepared of any sort. So I'll just say, first of all, I wanna tell you uh, my disclaimer, which is I am a psychologist um, and not just nine to five, it's pretty much who I am. I've been working in the field of mental health since uh, I graduated with my bachelor's degree from psychology in, from USC in 1982. Um, my students know that my teaching motto is psychology is life. And that's because there's not any aspect of life that psychology doesn't inform. So um, psychology has something to say about all aspects of our lives. Um, so I wanna share with you that um, <clears throat> it was mid-February. Uh, I was originally asked to do this in April. So mid-February, I was sitting in this really tedious three-day meeting in Washington, DC and um, taking a cue from my students, I seized the opportunity to multitask. They all know how I feel about that. And to start brainstorming for this lecture. So I wanted a concise message <clears throat> that I could leave as my legacy here at USC because that's the whole point of this last lecture, right? You know, and no pressure at all, by the way. Um, so I sat back and I let the droning at the microphone kind of fade and become background noise and I started to let my mind wander. Um, I tend to think in pictures and so there's one that kept coming to mind, this one. Let that picture sink in for a minute. Maybe you remember seeing this before and maybe it's your first time, but every time I look at it I go, whew, that's pretty intimidating, huh? Can you think of a time that you felt like this girl staring down some kind of bull in your life? I want you to look at it again and put yourself in that little girl's shoes. Masculine or feminine, this is clearly a child <clears throat> and a child who's in a vulnerable situation and no doubt scared. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this statue, the little girl was added facing down this other statue called the Charging Bull in the financial district of New York City. She was intended to be a temporary installment and she was named Fearless. The artist was Kristen Visbal and she was commissioned for International Women's Day, March 8th, 2017. And this statue made quite a splash. In fact, actually it netted over $7 million as a marketing strategy that was dreamed up by some large asset management company in support of female leadership and gender diversity. So another interesting tidbit about this is that the artist of the charging bull, his name is Arturo de Moca, really complained about her presence. Some of you may remember this at the time. He felt like it took away from his statue. And Mayor Bill de Blasio um, supported her juxtaposition to the bull saying, men who don't like women taking up space are exactly why we need the fearless girl. So she stayed in that location about a year longer than was originally intended and now she resides in a site across from the New York Stock Exchange. <clears throat> but here in front of the bull, there's a plaque of footprints that was left with her facing that bull. So this image came to mind, but not because this talk was going to be about women's empowerment, but because of this. I want you to look at her face. Next slide. Yeah. What do you see? I see someone who's composed and calm and resolute. I see the part of me or maybe the part of you that's facing a scary situation and standing firm. So male or female or anywhere on the spectrum of identity, we have all felt small in the face of something that's big and threatening. We all face them, these bulls. 
And if you're fortunate enough to say, well, I haven't really faced a bull, then what I can assure you is that one day that you will, we all will, because it's universal. Now I want you to look at her stance. It's, it's pretty, yeah, so we're, we're on slide four <laughs> as the slides go flipping through. Look at her stance. Um, so I have a confession here. It's probably not an accident that this particular position of fearless came to my mind because around the same time, back in the winter, I have to confess, I had started binging Grey's Anatomy. So years ago, I had left off in the series and I thought I should finish that while I have some time. Well, little did I know, I must have left off back in season seven and there's like 16 seasons and 24 episodes apiece. So it was quite the commitment. But somewhere along the way, we meet Dr. Amelia Shepard and she's a neurosurgeon and the younger sister of the very famous Dr. Derek Shepard, you know, McDreamy in the show. And as with most of the characters on this show, Amelia has her share of problems, including a history of substance abuse. So somewhere along the way, she's lost her confidence and her swagger. And I'm assuming you need a lot of swagger to be a brain surgeon, right? So then this picture popped into my head. Next slide. There she is. So after her crisis of confidence, and as she's about to perform a surgery that everyone else has determined cannot be done, a very terrified Amelia discovers this, the power pose. In fact, there's several studies out of psychology that have shown that standing in an open stance like that conveys a sense of power. And then there are subsequent studies that have shown that these open postures, like this power stance, can shift your hormones, and it's even been associated with lowering stress hormones like cortisol. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? And so Amelia adopted this as her pre-surgical ritual whenever she felt scared. So now flashback with me to DC in that meeting in February as these images were coming up in my mind. And I started to brainstorm then some of the character strengths that we can learn and we can practice to better navigate life skills. Um, and I love a good acronym. So I played with some words and I finally came up with this. Next slide, cope. Courage, optimism, perseverance, engagement. And then I thought, so how will you cope? Little did I know at that moment in the middle of February that six months later, our world would look the way that it does now and that our ability to cope had been stretched completely to the max like we are now. So now, how will you cope has so much more meaning than it did back in February when I dreamed it up. Next slide. So I have a mentor, um, a mentor that I've never met because she died just a few years into my career. I guess I should instead call her a grand mentor because she was actually the mentor of a number of my mentors. Her name is Virginia Satir and she was considered the mother of family therapy. She's also now commonly known for her many pithy sayings like this one. Problems are not the problem, coping is the problem. And as a psychologist, I couldn't agree more. We all have problems, but it's how we cope with them that truly affects us the most. So how will you cope? The first strategy is courage. <clears throat> Now, let me just say, it takes a lot of courage to stand firm facing bulls, especially when you feel small. Bulls come in many forms for us. It might be a lost job, a sick child, maybe it's a failing marriage. Perhaps it's trouble paying bills, maybe cancer. 
pay, uh, parents who begin to forget. <clears throat> Uh, an angry friend or a miss, uh, an angry friend over a misunderstanding, maybe hurricanes and wildfires, maybe a pandemic, maybe it's racial injustice and unrest, maybe it's political certainty. Really, these bulls or bullies, as someone noted, are anything or anyone who scare us. I always think about the Cowardly Lion and the Wizard of Oz, right? What was he looking for? Courage. What did he get from the wizard? He got a heart, right? That's because the word courage is derived from the Latin root core, meaning heart. It can be defined as strength in the face of pain or grief. And when I hear pain or grief, I think loss. And sometimes loss is just about transitions. Um, sometimes courage is synonymous with bravery, but I don't think it really is the same thing. Courage is not the absence of fear. It is the willingness to face the fate. It, sorry. It is the willingness to face that which scares you, whatever your current bull might be. So that's the resolve that you see on the face of fearless. Courage requires the willingness to be uncomfortable. This year, 2020 has, if anything, shown us how uncomfortable and harsh our world can be. We've had to face many, many bulls. And even the decision to return to school this year has taken some amount of courage. And to venture out of our homes to risk our health or the health of others has been very challenging. But again, this is not all about the pandemic. This last lecture is about getting the most out of this one life that we have. I want you to pause for a minute and think about a moment um, of something that you did or something that you faced that scared you. It may have been changing jobs, moving to a new city. Maybe it was separating yourself from a toxic person. Maybe it's launching a new project. Maybe it's following your dreams. That can be scary too. Maybe it's letting go of something that you know is right to let go of, despite all of the emotional ties that you have. It takes a lot of courage to leave a place of safety and security in any sort of way. Many of the things that scare us are the things that lack certainty, but when we take chances and we take a leap of faith, that's where the adventure begins, when we step out of our comfort zone. So I would say that courage requires some degree of trust, trust in yourself, trust in your intuition, trust in people who are trustworthy, trust in something that's greater than you, trust in the belief that the adventure is going to be worth the price of fear and uncertainty. And that's the magic that begins to develop out of being uncomfortable. But the magic grows not just from simply being uncomfortable and surviving, but when you begin to build confidence from those experiences, even when you fail, because all of us are going to fail. And when you fail and you survive to tell about it, you begin to feel like you can leap tall buildings in a single bound, right? That is known as resilience, the capacity to recover from difficulties. It's being flexible, it's having a thick skin, and it's about the ability to learn to bounce and to bounce back. Resilience breeds both confidence and competence. So that's what courage nets you, confidence and resilience. The second one of these is optimism. The Oxford Dictionary describes optimism as hopefulness and confidence about the future or the successful outcome of something. Now, optimism and resilience go hand in hand. In personality psychology research, we know that people who are resilient have an optimistic way of explaining events. 
It's on the opposite end of the spectrum from helplessness. Trusting in hopeful outcomes gets us back up, helps us dust ourselves off, and then we can try again. But there's an interesting little caveat about optimism. If it's your only basket, you may be disappointed time and time again, and you could end up feeling defeated by that sort of blind optimism. What we really need is to keep our optimism balanced with a heavy shot of reality. So next slide. So that's the optimism. Next slide. So this is known as the Stockdale Paradox. If you're not familiar with the story, it was coined by the author Jim Collins in his book called Good to Great. Collins wrote about James Stockdale, a naval officer who was held captive in Vietnam for over eight years, between 1965 and 1973. His capture, his captors tortured Stockdale multiple times for his determination, for his efforts not to be personally used as propaganda, and he was also punished and tortured for his attempts to get intelligence from the prison back to the U.S. In addition to those, we, yeah, we got ahead. Sorry, that was my fault. Um, in addition to those acts of courage, Stockdale did everything he could to shore up his fellow captives in order that they could also survive the torture. For example, he created elaborate ways that they could use tapping, kind of like a Morse code, but not detectable by their, um, uh, the people who imprisoned them so that they could communicate during these long periods of silence and um, times where they were kept completely isolated. After his release, Admiral Stockdale was, was uh, awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. So he was very clear though in his assessment that there was one group of people who didn't survive the optimist. Now, are you surprised? Because I was totally surprised by that. And I just suggested that optimism was the way to cope, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Hope for the best? But see, here's the thing. It's not that simple. Stockdale said that optimists kept hoping for release at like certain markers in time, like, oh, surely at Thanksgiving, maybe at Christmas, maybe when the new year comes. Um, and they were profoundly disappointed over and over. He believed that the optimists basically died of a broken heart, broken by ongoing disappointment. So this is what Stockdale said. He said, you have to have unwavering faith that you can and will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties. And at the same time, you must have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. So there's a the paradox, right? Both optimism about prevailing and the ability to see a harsh reality at the same time. It is holding what's known as the both and. But the key to this type of realistic optimism is to do something meaningful like he did and trust that you're going to prevail. So like Admiral Stockdale, you might reach out and help others through these tough times. You might work somehow for the greater good, to push for something that's the right thing, to take on some kind of meaningful work. I might even call this spiritual optimism, believing that there's something greater than you which will prevail, okay? Next is perseverance. <clears throat> So when I first wrote this, I actually used the word persistence. But when you start to explore the nuance of these two concepts, persistence is discussed out there in the world as being kind of rigid, kind of repetitive in a way. And perseverance is thought to have more flexibility or more fluidity to it. So while persistence might appear repetitive, perseverance seems to be about kind of weaving along and finding your way. So I want to ask you a question. 
Has anyone ever watched Rock Balancing or Rock Stacker? I am completely intrigued by these folks. And when I run across a small creek when hiking, I love to leave a few little balancing rocks in the stream or near the stream. But rock balancing is like a Zen activity. And I can tell you as an amateur, it is not easy. I had the fortune of watching a few of these folks at work before. Go to the next slide. Looks easy, but it's not. Can you go to the next one? So this is a photograph that I actually took. Um, this kid that was stacking these rocks, and, and I couldn't even begin. I mean, it was this huge stretch of this stream. This kid was wading in a mountain stream one October, balancing rocks at a long weekend music and arts festival. And he worked really quickly without even looking much at the rocks. He would look at the rock and select it, but then he would hold it and feel it and, and kind of measure it tactily, if you will. Um, get to know it with his hands. And then he would set it in place and voila, it just balanced like magic. And then he would find another rock and he would do the same thing and roll it around in his hands, feeling all the sides of it. And then intuitively he would stop, put it on another rock and that one would balance too. I was completely fascinated watching him do this. Another guy I watched, also took this picture, um, was on the San Francisco Bay um, on the Sausalita side, if you're familiar with that. And so it was a typical day in the bay, very high winds, although that picture doesn't look like it. And this guy looked like a Tai Chi master. He had a totally different approach from the kid I saw in the mountains of North Carolina. This guy would pick up a rock and he would hold it and look at it and measure it with his eyes. And then very slowly he would turn it and he would look at it. And then he would go and he would place it and then it just stuck. It was so magical. It looked like he must have super glue on it somehow. And then he would take the next rock and same thing. Be with the rock in this very Zen sort of way and look at it and hold it. And then that next one would balance. And you can see these are very precarious balance rocks that he was doing. So of course, I very, erroneous, very erroneously thought this must be simple, right? And it looked like so much fun. But let me just tell you, this is anything but simple. But if you ever have the chance, I encourage you to try it. It requires focus calm attention, persistence, because that top rock is going to fall and slide and the ones beneath it are going to fall out and you try and you try again and then eventually you get a voila, it sits and it stays. And I can assure you it's easy to get frustrated and to abandon this task altogether. Instead, it requires that you summon your will and your determination. Sometimes you need to pick a rock. Sometimes you need to examine the angles, feel the balance and the weight, use your intuition, practice as in state. That's perseverance, not just persistence, but being flexible and moving with it and finding your way. Here's the thing. We're all going to run into things that we can't figure out. We'll encounter circumstances that stump us, situations that make us stop and regroup. We are all going to fail at something, probably at lots of things. But sometimes we just need to keep looking for the solution to work on persevering. Eventually we'll get it. We may not be able to stack our rocks as high or in this exotic sort of pattern, but we can leave a little gift to the world when we use our strength of perseverance. Now, my psychologist friends and I often joke when someone is not being what's known as a one trial learner. So a one trial learner means that you're smart enough to learn from your experiences and your mistakes, right? But what about that? Because just like we heard about optimism, there's also a back kick to the mule to perseverance, as we like to say in Texas. 
So I was recently talking to a client who would get stalled out every time she was trying new things at work. So what had previously happened is that she had tried a new project and it had failed. And then she'd gotten some harsh words from her supervisor. She felt totally embarrassed, totally humiliated. We would too. And she definitely wanted to avoid that situation again. But what happened was that she formed what I would think of as like a writer's block from the experience. She just could not create anything new. She got totally stuck. Was that one trial learning? Yes. Was it a failure? Mm, maybe so, that particular project. Was it pers perseverance? No, not at all, right? She totally got stuck in that place. She couldn't move or think creatively. Her new rule became don't do something where you're going to fail and get in trouble, right? We felt that before. But we also hear try, try again or practice, 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 right? That's how you get to Carnegie Hall and all. Um, so again, if you find yourself stuck or you're tempted to stop at one trial when you fail, I would urge you to persevere. Use your imagination. Look at the problem from a different angle. Consider the weight and the balance of the dilemma. Practice that Zen state. That's what it means to persevere. So finally, the last part of COPE is the skill of engagement. So back in the early 1990s, when I was in graduate school, Dr. Martin Seligman, kind of an emerging psychologist rock star from UPenn, came to our campus to give a talk. Now, none of us knew much about him back then, but by the time we graduated, he was elected to serve as president of APA, the American Psychological Association, by the largest vote in the association's history. Within a couple of more years, he launched the area of positive psychology and became known as the father of positive psychology. So in his presidential address at APA, he said that the field of psychology, and this is a quote, the field of psychology moved too far away from its original roots, which were to make the lives of all people more fulfilling and productive. He went on to say that he wanted to participate in a science whose aim is building, uh, whose aim is the building of what makes life most worth living. Now, a lot of people underestimate what we mean when we talk about positive psychology and the science of happiness. But Dr. Seligman's research is very clear. And what he says is that leading a good life is not about a fleeting moment of happiness due to something that we think of as pleasure. But in fact, the two most important ways of being in your life account for the majority of life satisfaction. And these two ways of being in your life, he called the good life or the engaged life and the meaningful life. The third one, the pleasant life, makes a difference in happiness, but it doesn't substantially contribute to life satisfaction. So early in his theory, he believed that there were these three primary experiences that we seek, kind of the three legs to the stool, positive emotions, engagement, and meaning. He expanded it later, but that's a whole nother lecture. So our, for our purposes here, what do these mean? So Seligman said that the good life involves engagement or flow, this flow state. It, flow occurs when you're completely absorbed in something, something that's important to you. Have you had that experience? I know I have. Um, in the good life, he goes on to say, people, the way they're able to get to that flow place is that they are able to um, align things like their work, their leisure time, their relationships, their friendships, maybe even their parenting style so that they can use their strengths and values and spend more time engaging in these flow experiences. 
So these people leading what he calls the good life become fully engaged in their lives. Then according to Seligman, the meaningful life, and this is a quote, consists in belonging to and serving something that you believe is bigger than the self. So whether it's religion, whether it's your political party, whether it's your career, maybe it's dedicating your life to reducing your carbon footprint, <coughs> it might be your devotion to the arts or even your commitment to your family. But when I read that, I think the meaningful life also requires engagement. <coughs> A sort of loyalty to something bigger <coughs> than just you in this life. Sorry. <coughs> Getting me all choked up here. <laughs> so the question is, are you engaged? Are you fully engaged in your own life? <clears throat> are your strengths and values put to use in the things that you believe in? <clears throat> I'm totally choked up on myself here. <clears throat> um, hang on. So my question is, do you even know what your values are? Have you really sat down <clears throat> and spent time enumerating that, for example, identifying that? And what about your strengths? Do your values and your strengths align with how you spend your time? So let's break this down more personally. <clears throat> do you have a hard time saying no? Do you end up spending your free time with people that you really don't care about? Or do you not say no and then spend up, spend your free time doing things you would rather not be doing? Because that's not an alignment. <clears throat> if you make a list of your values, does television in any form, does that show up in the top five or even maybe the top 10? No. I've never known anyone who's making that sort of list who says, oh, television is number three for me, right? <clears throat> now, let me ask you another question. Do you watch TV every night? You know, that's an interesting way to think about this, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> so how engaged are you in the pursuit of the good life? Maybe not so much. Maybe you're just coasting. So the other option is to get yourself engaged in your life. Cull the list of people that you spend time with. Of course, this is pre-COVID. Volunteer for something that you say that you value. Ask your family members important questions and listen to the people that you love. Put your money where you say your values lie. <clears throat> now you've heard people say, life is short. I'm not sure about that, but I'm here to tell you tonight that life is at least fast. So hurry up, get engaged. Get engaged now, it's never too late. So we're back to our question. <clears throat> How will you cope? I'd suggest this. Put your hands on your hips. Do it with me now. I can see you. Put your hands on your hips. Put your chest up and open and breathe. No one's gonna critique you here on Zoom, I promise that. Breathe all the way down to your belly. You'll feel better, I promise. <clears throat> So face your bulls in this life with courage, optimism, perseverance, and engagement. Better yet, face your bulls with composed courage. You can go to the next slide. Composed courage, realistic optimism, flexible perseverance, and meaningful engagement. 
So go be a superhero in your own messy and marvelous life. And that's how you can cope. So questions, comments, thoughts, that's what I always ask my students. I'm gonna open up my chat box. <clears throat> Um, everyone, feel free to put your questions in the chat box or to use the hand raise feature and we can moderate and coordinate your questions. Or even just open up your mic and ask. So um, I'm going to start off with a question. Dr. Murray, how did you decide to go into the field of mental health? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> well, I majored in psychology, as I said, sorry, I'm playing with my um, view here and I've totally messed it up. I've lost everyone. Um, so I majored in psychology. I was originally kind of slated to be um, uh, in education because I thought I wanted to work with kids with um, intellectual disabilities. <clears throat> but um, I, a truth, the real true story is I walked in and looked around at the people who were there to be education majors and I was wearing my cowboy boots and I thought, I don't really fit in here. So I left and I went and changed my major to psychology and, um, and I had some great opportunities to help with research while I was there at the university. And those opportunities um, led me to believe, okay, I can do this. I can become a psychologist. And I, um, after I graduated, I looked for a job specifically in the field of mental health and was lucky enough to find one. A very low paying, not glamorous job, um, but it opened a lot of doors. <clears throat> Other questions? So I see the Californians asked a question. Can I say more about how I've been influenced by Virginia Satir? So um, one of my mentors, actually, Dr. Russell Haber, um, <clears throat> had done a fair amount of work with Virginia Satir over the years. And um, I did a bunch of trainings um, when I was a young professional before I went to graduate school. I didn't go to graduate school till late. So I did a bunch of trainings with Dr. Haber and his wife, Dr. Cooper Haber, Karen Cooper Haber. And they had so many great connections with all these family therapists and he, they would bring them to Columbia. Columbia was very fortunate in those days. So <clears throat> it was through them that I got introduced to Satir work. And later it was Dr. Haber who invited me to go to Satir Family Camp out in California. Um, and um, when I was in grad school, I also did a lot of training in family therapy. So during that time, um, I studied Virginia's work. How do you think you cope with changes throughout your life? What a great question. <laughs> you know, I'm, I am a master at perseverance. I might be rigidly, um, I might be rigid about my perseverance and how it's applied at times. Um, I actually sometimes have to practice the art of letting go. Um, but I'm kind of naturally um, genetically predisposed toward optimism, which is helpful. Um, I haven't had to fight that battle in my life. Um, but I would say these are skills I use for sure. And that and I lean on really good friends. Can you expand a little bit on how to keep realistic optimism on a day-to-day -day basis without it? I'm wondering if there's more to that. <clears throat> you know, I think the point of the Stockdale story, and it's actually called the Stockdale paradox, is this idea that it's one thing to sort of have this blind optimism, and maybe you've heard this joke. It's a, it's a, a joke about a flood 
where these people have made their way to the top of their roof. And um, uh, that's a great question. I'm going to come back to that. But um, so the people have made the way to the top of the roof and a rowboat comes by and the people in the rowboat are like, get in, get in, we'll save you. And the people on the roof are like, no, 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 God's going to save us. You know, God's going to help us. And then a power boat comes by, get in, get in. And they're like, no, 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 God's going to save us. God's going to save us. This is an anti, this is not an anti-religious joke, by the way. Um, but then along comes a helicopter and drops a basket down. It's like, hop in the basket. And they're like, no, 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 God's going to save us. And all of a sudden the skies open up and God's like, well, what more do you want? Like I've sent a motorboat, a powerboat and a helicopter, right? So the joke is really about what do we do for our own efforts? Um, I digress from, I think the question, I probably need to revisit the uh, chat box here, but um, oh, so how do you use it on a day-to-day -day basis? I think you have to be very realistic. Um, I think that realistic and hopeful that I can make it through this is one of the most power pieces of faith that we can have, one of the most powerful pieces of faith. And so somebody went on to ask, um, how do you keep it from slipping into pessimism or cynicism? It's kind of interesting because I had an extraordinarily cynical um, research professor in grad school, and we would have these debates about, can you be realistic without being cynical? And I'm really not sure that we ever came up with the answer to that. And uh, he died last year, but I would have liked to have come to some sort of resolution, but it may be like, I don't know, like a, you know, like a cone where it's a question with no answer. But I think you have to hold the two. Carl Jung was all about holding the tension of opposites. And so, you know, how do you, um, how do you both hold optimism that I can make it through and act realistically or act with the realistic circumstances that you're faced with, like the flood? Um, <clears throat> all right, the next one, how can you begin to trust yourself to be courageous if that's a challenge. I think it goes back to Carnegie Hall. I think it's practice, 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 and I think it happens in small steps. So sometimes being courageous might just be being assertive in the moment and standing up for yourself or stating a difference of opinion with someone of power, maybe. And so I think it starts in very small ways. And it's, um, I believe that it is one of those things that the more we practice it, the more comfortable we become. And I'm, a, I'm kind of big on the idea of rehearsal and practicing yourself. Because when you practice those hard things, they come out a lot easier when you need them. So let me give you an example of that. The university does um, really terrific um, suicide awareness um, training for the RAs and the resident mentors. And what they do is they have them go through these scenarios where they um, have to ask someone, well, have you thought about killing yourself? Or ask someone, have you been hurting yourself in some way? And they all think it's silly and ridiculous and they can't imagine how that's going to help them, right? <clears throat> um, but we at the Counseling Center used to help with these trainings and I later had a student come back and say, you know what, if you hadn't made us do that, I could have never asked the question. But I found myself opening my mouth and the words just fell out because I had done it before. So I think that's a great lesson in just practicing and using small approximate, approximations until you have to get to the really big things. But that's a good question. Um, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing so that everybody should be able to see each other now. Um, feel free to put on um, your video or unmute yourself if you have questions. But Dr. Merck, I was hoping you could share a little bit about your upcoming book. Oh, well, so um, that actually, and I'm looking at my colleague, if you want to unmute your mic and dive in, Amy. 
So um, my colleague, Amy Montanez, who's also my dear friend and I, uh, have been writing a blog called Messy Mar it's at MessyMarvelous.com. <clears throat> and we're on Instagram, Facebook, and all that. But it stands for Life is Messy, Life is Marvelous. And um, so Amy and I have been doing that for quite a while. And about a year ago, probably was when we cooked this up, we decided to write a series of books. So these, uh, uh, these blogs are based on life skills. So life skills for coping, actually. So if you want lots more coping skills, go visit our blog. But we decided to write some smaller groups of them and and target certain audiences. So it, do you mind if I say, Amy, should, should we go ahead and announce it? So our first book is called Launch, The Messy Marvelous Guide to Adulting, because we work with a lot of young people who, you know, say, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't, I don't know how to navigate my life out there in the world. I know how to be a student and I was a really good student, but I don't know how to do this. And so we've written this book. It's in the hands of our editor. I did see about two hours ago, she sent us an email back. So we are well on our way. Anything you want to add, Amy? <laughs> sitting here thinking, well, I'm in my pajamas. I, <laughs> I took, well, nobody would have known if you took, off, that. <laughs> took off all my makeup. I, I did not expect either to be <laughs> seen or talking. So this is very messy. Um, <laughs> That's okay. marvelous. Great job, Ray. Thank you. No, I, I just think we felt called really to, uh, put something out there in the world because you and I both work with a lot of emerging adults who are um, stymied in so many ways by what is needed in, uh, to launch effectively into the world. That movie, Failure to Launch, has come back in my mind several times. Um, and so, you know, the skills seem very basic, but apparently they're not anymore. <laughs> and so, and emerging adults is like uh, 20 and until, because I yeah. also see people in their 40s and 50s and 60s who uh, haven't emerged yet into adulthood. But um, I'm super excited about the book and uh, we kind of know what the next two are gonna be if we can just get this, <laughs> this first one right. out of the gate. Um, but yeah, it's exciting. And, um, and we'll be writing, writing. We'll be out of time for Christmas presents. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions lingering? I have one final question if nothing else comes in, but what are your favorite coping mechanisms for college students? Um, <coughs> wear your masks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, I would really say that time management is really the key. I mean, if I were to give one tip to call, well, uh, there's actually two things I would say for college success. One is get a planner and use it, you know, um, and it's really simple. My students today in class were talking about, you know, one of the, we were talking about stress and managing stress and, and they said, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And my thought is get a calendar, write it down. During these classes where we're not meeting face to face, get your book out <clears throat> in this dedicated time and work on this class for that 50 minutes. The second thing I would tell college students for success <clears throat> is get to know your professors. And, you know, I just scrolled through the people here and I've got a lot of former students and some current students here. And, and it, you know, we're, we don't teach because we don't care about students. Well, maybe there's a few of those. Okay, there's probably a lot of those, but there's a lot of us, and I think you're smart enough to figure it out, but there's a lot of us who want to get to know our students. And, um, and it never hurts you to get to know your professors. I can say that. Ray, I have, this isn't a question, or maybe it is, but I had a thought about the question about how do you stay um, realistic without falling into cynicism? And 
I was thinking, you know, if we were better students of history, whether that's American history or if you're religious of any kind, your own religion, salvation history, that history shows us that we will prevail mm -hmm. and that things mm -hmm. are difficult and that good people take the lead and, and we push on and we overcome and that continues and continues and continues. And I think mm -hmm. part of the pessimism and the cynicism that happens is because people don't know their history and sometimes they don't even know their own family history. True. And mm -hmm. so I, I think being better students of your personal history, your country's history, your religious history, whatever that is, is part of what keeps us from becoming cynical uh, because we do persevere. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, that's what happens if we are good students of history we, and we figure out what worked. It's a very good thought. Very good thought, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> And, and people have lived through very difficult things before without the tools that we have now, you know? I mean, there was a time when this pandemic hit that there would be, there would be no college going on right now. You know, when I was in college, that's what it would have been. You would have either gone in a mask and geared up or you wouldn't have gone. There wasn't anything in between. So we have more resources and more tools today that really shore up that, faith that we will prevail in this. Um, so we are coming up on the hour. So I really want to thank Dr. Merck for all of your um, time and your wisdom tonight. We really appreciate it. And to everyone who is still with us, thank you again so much for attending. Um, feel free to send any comments or feedbacks out to the last lecture email um, that should be included on the Eventbrite information, and we'll definitely be reaching out about future events. But again, thank you so much, Dr. Merck. And thank you all for coming. I want you to know I even have high school and college friends here, so <laughs> that's pretty cool. So it's uh, great to see the faces or, or the names if you're in your pajamas, right? Thank you. Where are you?